everyone. Hope you guys are all having a great day so far. My name is Jordan Beam. I'm a third year medical student at the UAB Hearsing School of Medicine. And today I'll be talking with you about a case report on the dupilumab use and treatment of refractory bullous pemphigoid. And my co-author is Dr. Joe Herzog, who's a dermatologist in Birmingham. So bullous disorders kind of in general, I'll give you a background before we get into our case. So if you've ever had a burn or gotten an injury and had a blister from that injury. Um, it's kind of like that, but it is um, kind of a blister gone wild. So a bullous disorder is fluid filled blisters kind of all over the body and it can extend across the skin. Um, and the bullet are defined as over one centimeter. So that's what we're calling bullets. Um, and they are vesicles, but bigger vesicles. So there are different types of bullet. We have autoimmune causes, um, which are, let's see, move this so I can see this picture. Sorry. Okay. So this is kind of our normal skin layer. So we have the epidermis and then the dermal layer and the basement membrane in between. Um, so different autoimmune causes, I'm just kind of going to expand in the autoimmune causes because that's what our case involves. So in the epidermal skin layer, we have stratified squamous cells that are connected by desmosomes. So those are the connections that connect our skin cells. And in autoimmune causes of bullous disorders, we have IgG antibodies. So these are antibodies against the desmosomes that hold the skin cells together. So these patients um, have kind of skin breakdown in that top epidermal layer and fluid can fill in between these cells. So can you see my mouse by any chance? I'm doing some pointing. Okay, thank you. I was just making sure I wasn't pointing in the dark. Thank you. Okay, so the fluid can sneak in here and then Something interesting on physical exam finding for these pemphigus vulgaris patients is they have flaccid bullae. So their blisters kind of look like a blister that's popped. So if you rub your hand across it, it's what's called a Nikolsky sign on physical exam. So you can disrupt this top skin layer. Um, and that can be kind of a differentiating factor between pemphigus vulgaris and bullous pemphigoid. So that skin can be disrupted and break down. So in bullous pemphigoid, there are still IgG antibodies, but they are mediated against a different um, component. So we have hemidesmosomes that connect the epidermal and the dermal layer. So we have the basement membrane right here. So this is kind of a linear separation. So the skin layer is still intact on the top. So these blisters, we'll see a picture in a second. They're still intact on the skin, but the fluid kind of sneaks in under there. So we have tense bullet that if you were to rub your hand across it, you couldn't disrupt it like you could in pemphigus vulgaris. So that's probably a lot more than you guys needed to know about that, but that's what the case involves. So I wanted to make sure we had a good background on that, but um, we'll kind of just touch on the other causes. So we have mechanical, which are is a genetic mutation that some patients have towards different skin components, such as collagen, um, keratin, and laminin as well. And so these patients are more susceptible to skin breakdown, so they can develop bullous disorders as well. And then metabolic, that includes diabetic um, patients that have can develop bullous disorders. And then we have some enzyme deficiencies. So porphyria patients also can develop these bullous disorders. And then allergic causes are normally drug mediated. So if patients have reactions to the top players are NSAIDs, uh, ACE inhibitors, we have diuretics and diabetic treatments such as DPP-4 inhibitors. And then we have TNF inhibitors as well. So a lot of the, those are the offending agents that I wanted to mention. And normally the treatment depends on the etiology, but the main treatment that differs is if it's an allergic response, you would just stop the offending agent if it was drug mediated. And that's normally the first thing that if a patient develops this, one of these conditions and they're on some of the top drugs, such as an NSAID or a diuretic, they the first step is just to kind of take those patients off those drugs just to make sure it's not drug mediated. Um, and then traditional treatment for bullous disorders, the top treatment is steroids. So we have topical or oral, depending on the extent of the disease. And then if these patients aren't able to tolerate steroids or their um, their condition is not responsive to steroids, they're able to move on to some non-steroidal agents such as Dapsone, and it actually inhibits the myeloperoxidase part of the inflammatory pathway. So it acts as an anti-inflammatory agent in that way. And then two other agents that are used in, conduct, in conjunction are doxycycline and niacinamide, and they are also non-steroidals um, that can be used as anti-inflammatory agents as well. And then if patients are refractory, normally these agents can cover these patients and they see remission in about six to five, six months to five years of treatment, um, which is, seems kind of like a long time, but these patients find relief normally with this treatment. But if they aren't able to, the refractory patients are treated with chemotherapy agents such as azathioprine and methotrexate, and then biologics are also an option. 
So that brings us to our case, if I can move the slide, perfect. Um, so we have an 83 year old female with a six month history of bullous pemphigoid that failed the traditional treatment. So this patient was had developed this condition and she was placed on high dose steroids, which unfortunately sent her into a psychosis and she was admitted to the hospital. So this was a very unfortunate situation and her bullous pemphigoid treatment was kind of put on the back burner until she was stabilized. So she was discharged from the hospital, taken off the steroids and placed on Dapsone because she still had pretty extensive presentation of bullous pemphigoid. So the Dapsone unfortunately also gave her trouble. Um, she was she developed a hemolytic anemia on the Dapsone. And so the two top treatments that normally work for patients were not only didn't help her condition, but gave her other problems as well. So some other options needed to be considered, but her medical conditions of note were CHF, hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and hyperthyroidism. And these are some medications that she is taking for those conditions. And on physical exam, she had these tense bullae. So you can see this is what her feet looked like on presentation to the clinic, as well as her hands, um, which as you imagine, can be very painful, especially if you're using those hands a lot and trying to walk on your feet. Um, it really hindered her um, daily life. So she also had eye involvement. So a lot of these patients can have tissue involvement and develop bull eye actually in their eyelids, which cannot be fun. So this is actually not her immunofluorescence, but this is what it normally looks like. So she was found to have linear deposition of IgG in the, um, in the basement membrane layer. So in between the epidermis and the dermis layer of the skin, she was found to have linear deposition of IgG on direct as well as IgG on indirect. So this patient, if she were to have pemphigus vulgaris, as we talked about a little earlier, normally that presents as kind of a wavy distribution, but it was confirmed as bullous pemphigoid because it was more of a linear in between that epidermal and dermal skin layer. So because it was confirmed to be kind of autoimmune mediated, um, even so we wanted to make sure that there wasn't a a drug component or an allergic component. So her, she was on Lasix or furosemide and that was discontinued just to make sure that was not a contributing factor to exacerbating her disease. Um, and her anemia began to improve. So she was started back on a lower dose of steroids and Dapsone that she was, that then she was on before. And you may be thinking, why was she started on these drugs when she had trouble in the first place? But these are still the first line treatments that normally a lot of pa patients see relief in. And it was hoped that with a lower dose, she would not see those side effects, but would hopefully find some relief, as well as combined with some niacinamide and doxycycline. Um, so her bullous pemphigoid remained stable in her anemia as well. So an extra, out of an abundance of caution, she was given serial CBCs just to make sure that her hemoglobin remained stable on that DAP zone. So keeping an eye on that as well. But her bullous pemphigoid did not significantly improve. So she was still having trouble with that, still had those... Um, those bullet that we saw in the picture earlier, and she was just in pain. So dupilumab is kind of one of those treatments I mentioned that can be used for refractory patients. So patients can consider chemotherapy agents as well as dupilumab or biologics such as dupilumab. So dupixin, as we know, is normally used for asthma or atopic dermatitis. So it's approved for those conditions. And it this is just a little bit on the way it works. So it targets the um, IL-4 receptor, which is common to IL-4 and IL-13 cytokines as a part of the allergic pathway, which it's TH2 mediated. And there's been a lot of research that suggests that bullous pemphigoid is also involved in this pathway. So that's why dupilumab has been shown to work in some patients that are refractory to the traditional treatment. So I'm happy to report that when she was placed on dupilumab with a combination of her steroids, her dapsone, her niacinamide, and her doxycycline, she did start to see some significant improvement, which was a lot better than she had before with any other agent. So she was not placed on dupilumab monotherapy at the beginning, but she was slowly weaned off of her dapsone and her condition continued to improve. She didn't get worse. Um, and then her steroids were slowly tapered. So this all kind of happened over the course of months, just to make sure that um, she didn't kind of go backwards and just make sure that she remained healthy. So I'm happy to report she remains well on dupilumab monotherapy and she comes back into the clinic for injections every two weeks. And I just want, I thought it was worth mentioning that there are multiple case reports on furosemide associated bullous pemphigoid. So that's just something to be aware of. Normally it is drug mediated, um, but something that I thought was unique about this case was that the traditional treatments were, were not only not effective for this patient's bullous pemphigoid, but um, they caused her extra pro or ad additional problems. So just something to consider um, that biologics can be effective in the treatment of bullous pemphigoid. 
And this has actually been cited in the literature some, but there hasn't been a robust study investigating the actual concrete effects, but there have been um, suggestions that dupilumab can work in bullet disorders. So you just have to get a special approval to be able to use the, dr the drug and then um, you're able to. So I just wanted everyone to be aware kind of of the different manifestations of bullet disorders and what the common players of offending agents drug-wise are, and then how to handle patients that don't respond to the traditional treatment. So thank you for all for your attention.